Sorry. Yeah, did you, did you read the part about it? Like, I guess they brought the tracks over on some boat that was like the SS Buffalo, and that's how they made the track. Oh, was that? Well, yeah, I did, I did read the, read all of it. That's, cool. that's how they put the name in. Can everybody hear me? Patrick, Alejandro, Julia? Yeah, we can hear you over here. Yes. I was listening to the recordings, and it's clear you can hear that I'm talking to a, uh, a mask. Can you guys understand me all right when I'm talking? Yeah, you're, you're pretty, uh, we understand you. What was that? We can understand you through the mask, I'm pretty sure. OK. Yeah, I'll try to maybe talk a little bit slower or try to enunciate a little bit better, but it definitely sounds muffled on the recording. So I apologize for that. The uh, did you guys get the email from me here about forty five minutes ago about the Canvas course? It didn't um, the course the Canvas page is posted the so the the way it's set up and actually I can maybe show you real quick. Let's go to Zoom and tell it. Share. 
So just to give you a real quick. So when you come in here, this should be what you see, if you haven't had a chance to look at it already. Um, what I did want to, to point out so that you guys kind of understand the way this is laid out, the framework for this course was, is, is with like these modules down here for when I teach it fully online, where I don't have like weekly lectures or daily lectures through the week. And so there's content here that follows the same flow that we're going through the material here, but it, I would encourage you to look at it as basically like supplemental or additional content. Uh, if you want to watch it or look at it, you can it'd be this basically the same lectures without the, you know, without any, I'm not, I'm speaking just in front of a camera. There's no student there um, or anything like that. There's no, no interaction with anybody. The uh, classes that we've done so far that have been through Zoom that are recorded are available uh, through these links. And if you click on them, it should open up and uh, allow you to play those if you want to, like if you want to review some material um, and, and go back through it or whatever, or if you, you, know, you happen to miss a class or whatever the case might be, you can go in and watch that. Um, back to where I was. And in these, they're, uh, it's the same content broken up into smaller recordings there's you know probably eight to 12 minutes or thereabouts in length and maybe a little bit more digestible um like i said they were recorded over in uh all right welcome back we're gonna get started today talking about turf prep back over in turlington in one of the studios over there back when i had hair <laughs> um I've since decided that it's not worth trying to keep that so uh but anyway, the content's basically the same. So if you wanted to watch anything like that, you can. Um, back to where it was. And then in a couple of the cases, for instance, when we go to, I think it's, uh, if you go to the home, it'll take you back to here. I think it's maybe module three. There's a couple additional materials here. Um, I've got a couple sort of, uh, multimedia tools that you can use that highlight some of the points that we talk about for identifying grasses and kind of help you understand that. And then there's a link to some videos that I have on YouTube for identifying the grasses where I've got a, a microscope lens on a, on a camera and show those features in a little bit more detail so that you can see what we're talking about. If we talk about having hairs on the legule, uh, clasping oracles or things like that. So you can go, go take a look at those videos if you want. To learn a, bit, a little bit more about identifying the grasses, or um, like I said, some of the modules have different things like that added to them. All right. So, any questions about anything so far? I can't find any uh, PDFs or, or uh... PowerPoint slides for the modules that we're doing right now on the. Uh... I, you're correct, and I need to. I was going to uh, upload those. I'll add those next to the. Um, if I add it, so the way the, the week, like the daily lectures go, we spill across multiple days, but I will, when we, I will add them in there by title, and they, they'll be just a file basically like my PowerPoint right now, if you look at the PowerPoint that I've got right now, it's 105 slides or whatever. I can upload that as a, a slide set, like six to a page or, and then you guys can, that'll go across of course multiple days, but I'll get those uploaded so that you can download those and take notes on them or whatever you want to. I, I just I wanted to make sure you hadn't posted them yet. I just thought maybe I could. No, I, if you program. dig down into some of the modules, you might find some that I didn't get cleaned out, but. Uh, no, I don't have those up there yet. I'll get them up. All right, cool. Thanks. Yep. Everybody can see the St. Augustine decline slide. 
Yeah. So we're, there's a couple. Uh, oh, huh, you guys are looking at board. Last week, we you got you just kind of continued on with uh, turf grass varieties, or not last on Monday. Yeah, we're talking about uh, we should be in uh, St. Augustine grass right now. Perfect. Yep. So with uh, St. Augustine grass, there are two. For the longest time, there was just one sort of viral disease that tended to impact St. Augustine grass, though it didn't really have any impact on St. Augustine grass in Florida, and that was St. Augustine decline virus. Um, it hasn't been a problem in Florida. Symptoms of it are very typical of what you'd see with a viral disease with the uh, sort of mottled chlorotic uh, lesions in the leaves. Simple, I mean, if you look at, if you're familiar with tobacco mosaic virus, in tobacco leaves, it does a very similar sort of thing. You get this mottled mosaic uh, uh, chlorotic spots and then eventually die back of the plant. Uh, not something that we see in Florida anymore. Uh, it has been a problem in, in some of the other Southern states, but it has, has not been an issue here. That being said, in, in, until about five years ago, that was the only viral disease that we talked about in St. grass. Now, with about, within a, uh, about the last five years, the, uh, um, go away. Within about the last five years, uh, down in sort of the Sarasota, Tampa area, there was a new kind of problem that popped up. And what was happening initially was that these yards full of Floritam. Now, Floritam has a cultivar of St. Augustine grass, makes up about 40,000 plus acres of sod production in the state. It's the largest single cultivar planting of, of any grass in the state of Florida when you look at the acreage total that's out there. And so Floritam for the industry is really an important cultivar. There were yards of Floritam that they were dying out and they'd go back, resod them. And about three years later, they'd die out again. And they started looking at this a little bit more closely and figured out that the uh, symptoms that they were seeing in it uh, were typical of what you'd see with a viral pathogen. And they were able to isolate from it a sugarcane mosaic virus. And so the this, this sugarcane mosaic virus had somehow made its way into the Floritam plant community and Floritam was susceptible. Interestingly, if you look at all of the St. Augustine gra grass cultivars that are on the market, Floritam is the only one that will actually die from it. The other cultivars, they do get, they do get it, they do get some decline from it, but they don't typically uh, actually, you don't typically lose the entire canopy from uh, the mosaic, sugarcane mosaic virus. It is uh, uh, an issue that has a huge impact on the, the sod industry in Florida. As you can imagine, with that many acres that are planted to Floritam, it's a huge investment to be able to consider like what they're going to look at as an alternative. And if you make that investment into changing to a new grass, you don't necessarily know that, you know, three or five years down the road, that the virus may not mutate in a way that the new grass that you've invested in doesn't become susceptible. So there's a lot of hesitation and a lot of anxiety over what this is going to do to the residential turf grass market in Florida. Uh, but it certainly is a problem that is spreading. Uh, like I said, it started down on the, on the Western coast. It is getting further and further from its origins. It spreads through equipment. One of the primary ways that they've noticed that it spread, spread through landscape management companies going from an infected yard to you know, their next job and, and carrying it on their lawnmowers and weed eaters and whatever else that they have. And so there's a lot of education being put into sanitation practices between, uh, you know, between properties and trying to minimize that spread, but it is certainly a problem that the industry is trying to deal with. Um, Thing is not working. Chinch bugs. If you've dealt with a St. Augustine grass lawn at all, you probably have heard of chinch bugs. They're tiny. And, and I want you to take note of the, the width of this leaf blade and, and the size of the insect related to it. You have to really get down in the canopy 
what you'll see is a, a sort of a decline of the of the grass almost looks like it's getting drought stressed or or dying back sort of slowly not in a patch pattern but more general uh gen general decline through an area and if you get down and look in there you they'll either be uh sort of dark colored with the white spots like this or sometimes you can see some of the other stages of the life cycle that are sort of red in color but they're an eighth of an inch to maybe three uh three sixteenths of an inch in size they're very small they move really quick and the only way to really get them and see them is to get down on your hands and knees, pull the canopy back so that you can see down into the base of the leaves and down into the stones. And what you'll hopefully catch is them kind of scurrying back away from you. Uh, but they, they, they do kind of disappear and hide really quick. Uh, they do cause a lot of problem with St. Augustine grass. Um, floor tam, one of the reasons that it actually gained a lot of popularity was that it was was chinch bug resistant when it first came on the market. It is still chinch bug resistant in Texas, in parts of the, the, the Southwest. It no longer has chinch, chinch bug resistance in Florida. So if you've got floor tam in Florida, you're probably going to have issues with chinch bugs at different times. Uh, this is just a picture showing where the floor tam entry here compared to some of those around it, you know, wasn't dealing with that pressure. And again, that, was part of the reason that floor tan became so popular uh, on the market is that it had that resistance as part of it. We were talking before class started and before I started the Zoom about the, the whole process of, of breeding grasses or selecting grasses. And you know the turf grass breeders, when they're working on identifying a new grass that would meet the needs of the industry, they look for something like that. So this uh, sugar cane mosaic virus is certainly probably going to be something that is going to be used to screen new cultivars that come on the market. Not that it may necessarily make or break a cultivar being released, because there may be enough other positive characteristics about it that would drive the, the opportunity for it to succeed on the market. If it has better drought stress, lower water use, uh, lower mowing, things that are gonna reduce the inputs into taking care of it, things that are gonna maybe reduce the amount of disease pressure, um, outside of sugarcane mosaic virus, those may be enough to push a grass forward in the market and, and give it some market share. But you know, the, the turf grass breeders will look at these issues that are facing the end user and look for germplasm that, that addresses that, that has resistance to whatever it is, has better drought tolerance, has better management characteristics. And then they try to incorporate that characteristic. Maybe the grass doesn't look exactly the way you'd like. Maybe it's a a St. Augustine grass plant that has great chinch bug resistance, has great you know, water use characteristics from the standpoint of being able to tolerate drought and is uh, resistant to the sugarcane mosaic virus, but it grows 10 inches tall. Well, that wouldn't be great, right? Because from a mowing standpoint, that's not gonna be an ideal situation. If it's a thin, tall canopy, that's not gonna provide the, what we want from the landscape. But the turf grass breeder would look at something like that and say, well, I can take that plant and try to figure out a way to move that those characteristics from that plant into something that's maybe a little bit more desirable in terms of its physical characteristics, its morphological characteristics. Uh, so, you know, this was an effort in, in through that breeding that they found some of the chinch bug resistance. Shade's another thing, right? Shade in Florida landscapes is a huge issue. One of the things that you will find if you haven't already is Visiting with homeowners, they almost always will come and say, well, what do I plant under my tree? Or the conversation will start like, I had no problem. You know, we, we built this house 10 years ago. We didn't have any problems with the turf. And now all of a sudden we've got areas in our yard that are failing and we happen to be sawed on a regular basis. Well, what has changed in your landscape? Nothing's changed in my landscape. I haven't added any new trees. I haven't done anything new. But it, when you start to put the pieces together, you know, 10 years ago, the tree was a two inch caliper tree that was 15 feet tall. 10 years later, you've got a six or eight inch caliper tree that's got a, a, a fairly large dense canopy to it. And when you start to ask questions and understand the context of which, you know, where they're coming from and how that landscape has changed over time, you can get a better understanding of things that might be driving what's happening to make turf grass fail. So that part of the yard that never had a problem 
when the canopy was small and relatively thin, was getting enough sunlight. But as that canopy gets bigger and gets more dense, suddenly the plant doesn't have enough sunlight to do what it needs to do. And you'll see it fade out. Now, from a breeding standpoint, of course, you know, shade is a, a big thing. The, uh, there's a group of about five or six universities that have turf grass breeding programs here four or five years ago that looked at a shade tolerance of a bunch of experimental St. Augustine, Zoysia, uh, seashore grass, palamon, reader grasses. Because shade almost universally is a problem with warm season grasses. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a residential landscape where you have primarily either Zoysia or St. Augustine, or if you're talking about you know, Florida field. As we get, you know, if you look at Florida field, which side of the stadium has the, the highest, you know, exposure or, block, or blocks the most sun? The east or west side? The west side, right? Where you've got all the, the, box, the box seats and that huge tall uh, part where the president's box and media and everything sits, right? If, as we go into the fall, and even now, but as we go into the fall and they start playing, that western sideline starts to thin out pretty quick because it's shaded, particularly as you know, we get later in the season here, it's the western sideline shaded from about three o'clock in the afternoon through the rest of the day, particularly along the, the part where the team stands and, and the first you know, five or 10 yards out into the edge of the field. And that shade, even though it's artificial shade and you know, it's full exposure otherwise, it does have an impact on that stand and if we had a grass that maybe tolerated shade a little bit better, you'd have fewer issues in those types of situations. Um, how do the grasses respond to shade? This is gonna be something that you could expect to see from any turf grass. This was St. Augustine grass in this particular example, but all of these pots were grown in full sun and maintained at the same height of cut and then submitted to either 30, 50 or 70% shade or left in full sun, okay? And not mowed, not cut. And after a period of time here, we see that the, the full sun exposure, St. Augustine grass has still maintained a tight, dense canopy. And as the amount of shade increased, what happened? Our leaf length increased. So what is the plant doing in that situation? stretching it's trying to find light right if we put these plants into a closet those they would have done the same thing but the leaves would have been white basically it almost completely lack chlorophyll because it wasn't being exposed to the sunlight <clears throat> um, now knowing this and this again goes for all grasses if it's a full sun exposure and we're mowing we can mow at the same height of cut on a weekly basis or whatever, and have very little impact on that plant because we're probably not going to mow off a lot of tissue relative to something that is maybe in 30 or 50 percent shade in that same week of time. How much more if our if our height of cut here is you know on the, on the full sun exposure is only removing about two inches of leaves? We come over here, we remove that same down to the same canopy height, we're removing probably at least 50, if not 60 or 70% of that canopy, right? What we've talked about so far, what happens with the root system when we, what is the relationship between the root system and the leaves? They're proportional. The, the plant will, will grow roots to support, that it can support what the leaf tissue has present, right? If you've got more leaves and more photosynthetic production, you're gonna have more, vigorous roots. There's a relationship there. When we come in here, not only does this response require the plant to, to consume carbohydrates, to produce leaves and hope that it'll reach sunlight and be able to produce more carbohydrates. It also has a, an effect of, of causing roots to grow that when we come back a week later and, and mow it, it's gonna end up slipping back off because it doesn't have the canopy to support them. So over time, this is a, a vicious cycle that ends up in the plant basically starving itself to death. 
because it's not able to get enough light to meet its photosynthetic needs. It's consuming carbohydrates that are stored to produce the leaves to hopefully get to light. And it's producing carbohydrates to produce roots to support the leaves that were end up sloughing off when we mow. And so you can see how this over time, it, depending on the level of shade that it's under, it'll crash quick. It, it's just an, an inevitable thing to happen that it's going to crash quick. And so if you look at our maintenance require, our recommendations, when we put grass in shade, not that this happens, but what can we do when grass is growing in shade to help mitigate this response? It's not going to fix it, but it'll hopefully make it better. So frequent mowing could help. Frequent mowing could help because you're going to, with each mowing of it, you're going to be removing less tissue, right? So frequent mowing could help. More importantly, and you're, and you're on the right, right track, is raising the height of cut. So in that reduced light environment, the leaves need more surface area to absorb more solar radiation. And so if we can give them a, a taller canopy in that reduced light environment, it's gonna have a better chance of survival. It's not gonna fix all your problems. But what we do recommend typically is about a 30% increase in your height of cut in shaded environments. It's great for us to recommend. Landscape management companies aren't going to do it. Chances are you're probably not going to do it with your own home lawn. It's not something that necessarily as a matter of practice is easily implemented. Golf courses with tighter control over things and the ability maybe to have the equipment that's set up to different, you know, if they know that they've got several shaded tees, they may be able to go out with a, you know, a set of walk mowers that are set just for those tees and dedicate them with a little bit higher height of cut. You're not gonna see golf courses do this on a green. They're not going to mow a putting green at a different height of cut, you know, than the others, because they want consistency across that playing surface. So the greens are all going to be made mowed at the same height. Probably won't see it with fairways for the same reason. But some, you know, where we deal with shade on a golf course is either usually the greens or the tees, where it's a high visibility, high traffic type situation, and maybe they would maintain some of those areas a little bit different. Fairways probably aren't going to be touched. Um, Tees are our greens aren't going to be touched generally because of the, the playable aspect of it and maintaining that, that playability. But it is something that we, we know that we can do. Centipede grass. What does centipede grass share in terms of physical characteristics or morphological characteristics with St. Augustine grass? Blunt leaf tips, the blunt or rounded leaf tips. Growth habit. What did I say about growth habit? You have stolen their first growth habit. All right. We'll have some hairs at the legule, but St. Augustine grass typically will have fewer. I'll show you some pictures uh, and, and walk you through some of that. It's native to southern China. It has medium shade tolerance. It's not going to be as shade tolerant as St. Augustine grass. It is consistently lighter in color than St. Augustine grass. I've got centipede grass in my front yard mixed with some Bahia and some uh, uh, St. Augustine grass. It is a much lighter green color than the other grasses. The stems in my yard are almost always red speckled with green, where St. Augustine grass stolons will typically be more green in color. Uh, it is slow to grow, it's slow to establish, typically established by seed, uh, but establishing it by seed can be a problem because the weed control becomes a problem. It's so slow to grow in the canopy that weed control can be an issue. Uh, there are, of course, places you can get it by sod. It can be vegetatively propagated from that standpoint. Um, but one of the challenges with centipede grass from a vegetative standpoint, particularly sod, is that it's not a high value grass. When you look at the, the amount of money that they're able to charge for it, it becomes difficult to justify producing sod. So there's a few farms that will, but it's not a high dollar uh, crop from the standpoint of what they're able to charge, and you don't see a lot of sod production with it. Similar to St. Augustine grass, and we'll talk about uh, carpet grass in a little bit, as <clears throat> all three of them have folded vernation. All three of them are going to have, this says membranous, membranous for short hairs, and technically, if you were to get in tight enough, you may be able to see a membrane on, on centipede grass. I will tell you right now, without a microscope or, or really the right sample, 
just trust that there's short hairs there. You, when we talk about seashore pass pallum, I'll show you a membranous with hairs ligule. Um, but the, the reality is from a pure looking at it standpoint, you won't see that membrane as much as you will the hairs on the ligule. Compressed sheath, <clears throat> um, no auricle, a finer leaf blade or leaf texture than St. Augustine grass. The leaves are narrower and typically a little bit shorter than what we see on St. Augustine grass. Centipede, one of the things that's unique to it, that when we look at the, the legal area here, okay, that picture or that picture right there, if you think back to the St. Augustine grass that we looked at, what's different? Does St. Augustine have like a pinch on both sides? Well, both of them are really constricted at the collar. So I'm looking specifically at the ligule where this, these hairs. And what I, what I hope to, to drive home, and maybe we can, we'll, I'll show you some, some samples in person. St. Augustine grass has very few, if any, hairs at the ligule, where centipede has this really dense, really obvious clump of hairs. I had a student the first year that I taught, we'll talk about uh, carpet grass here in a little bit. We looked all three of these grasses, stolen air first, blunt leaf tip, folded vernation. They're very, very similar and they can be easy to mix up. The one thing that's really unique about them is this part of the plant right here. On St. Augustine grass, there's almost no hairs. There's a few there, but almost none. If you look at a St. Augustine grass leaf margin, basically no hairs on the leaf margin. Centipede has a couple, okay? Carpet grass, when we look at that, carpet grass is going to have almost nothing at the ligule, but it has about four or five really distinct trichomes or hairs right at the base of the leaf on the margin. So there's a couple things there that we're looking at that can help you figure out and distinguish one from another. When you look at carpet grass, you look at the side profile of it over here, you're not going to see a dense clumping of hairs for the ligule like you do on centipede. And the, uh, the student, his name is Jack Kremling, he's the superintendent at, at Golden O'Caller now. Uh, but I always remember him saying, well, uh, carpet grass doesn't have a carpet. You know, it, as a way to try to remember, it was his way of remembering that centipede has this really dense clumping of hairs and carpet grass, even though it sounds like it might have, doesn't. Um, wide use of uh, soil conditions really used a lot in, in low quality soils. It can handle low pHs, has low fertility requirements, can be propagated by a number of different things. The seed is expensive. It's not a very prolific seed producer. So harvesting and getting the seed that you need is, is tough and it will be quite a bit more expensive than what you'd see in some of the other grasses. It is seeded at a lower rate because of the cost. And again, that complicates the establishment because then you've got a lower plant density, a slow growing plant, more weed pressure. It is susceptible to nematodes and ground pearls. Uh, this is a picture of trying to establish centipede by seed, the amount of weed pressure that you can get into it. It does have a low height to cut, one to two inches in, in canopy. I, in my front yard where I have centipede grass, I mow it about three and a half inches and no matter how long that centipede grows, I just mow the tips of the leaf blades off. It does not grow vertically very much. Where the bahia grass goes up, you know, six or eight inches, the St. Augustine grass can grow up, you know, four or five inches real easily, you know, or, or more if I let it go longer. The centipede never gets very tall, has a more prostrate growth habit. Low fertility requirements, can require some irrigation during droughty periods. It's not as drought tolerant as bahia grass, in my, my experience, the hair grass will stay green during drought far longer than any of the other warm season grasses. That doesn't mean that they die, right? They go dormant during that drought stress. Um, but if you're looking for something to main, maintain color without irrigation, this isn't going to be one of them. The hair grass does a great job with no irrigation. Um, drawbacks with the hair grass, coarser leaf texture, seed head production, things that make it sort of detract from its overall quality. This is pretty typical. This is looking down at a pot of centipede grass. And this is pretty typical of what you see with a stand of centipede grass. When you compare it to something like 
uh, Bermuda grass or St. Augustine grass, this typically has a, uh, a more open canopy. It still produces a pretty nice turf cover if you look at it from the road, but as you walk across it, you can see down into the canopy more. The hay grass is very similar. It has a more open turf canopy, lower leaf density, and you know, visually when you're walking across it, it doesn't look as appealing as maybe St. Augustine grass or Bermuda grass it has a very dense leaf density, a very tight canopy. Ground pearls, uh, a little things that, that feed on the root system. I've not seen them on centipede, uh, but they are a problem that can pop up and can impact the quality and, and uh, the, the vigor of the plant. It does have a tendency to go carotid during periods of the, of the year. This is a picture where uh, they looked at fertility aspects of it. And you know, if we look at chlorotic grass like this, when we start to see it turn yellow, what do we often think about? We think about things like nitrogen in many cases. You know, if we see a grass starting to look hungry, we often think of it as being nitrogen related. Um, here's you know, nothing applied. Here's iron application alone. And here's you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and iron all together. And what is typically going on here is we see a micronutrient deficiency that we can often mitigate with just an iron application and not be putting a bunch more fertilizer on. Remember, this is a low fertility plant. It doesn't need a lot of nitrogen. If we put a lot of nitrogen into it, we're probably going to increase the disease pressure. We may increase weed pressure because some of these other weeds are going to grow more vigorously than what it does. And so understanding that aspect of centipede grass can be helpful if you know that chlorosis is potentially going to be a problem, that you can correct it and mitigate that many times with an iron application. Usually we recommend a foliar iron application that can help fix that aesthetic issue and not have the complications of increasing disease and insect pressure and things like that. Spittle bugs uh, do like centipede grass. They actually, I think I've got another picture here. If you find them in there, so this is a spittle bug and they'll feed down at the base of the plant and leave this sort of, look like somebody just spit into the canopy. Now they get their name. Um, but what you'll see in the response is the, the plants, the leaves will start to turn purple from some of that feeding damage. Zoysia grass. We talked a little bit about zoysia grass. What does zoysia grass share with Bermuda grass? You guys remember? Talk, has the same right, growth habit, Stoloniferous and rhizominous. They both have pointed leaf tips. They both have hairs at the ligule. Does anybody remember what is different between zoysia grass and Bermuda grass? So zoysia grass will have a more even internode length, though I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that as a diagnostic, but that is a characteristic that you can see. So if you look at the internode lengths and they all look even, don't trust that that's absolutely given that it's soja grass, but it is a, a trait that can help narrow it down. What else is different? The vernation. Bermuda grass has a folded vernation. Zoysia grass has a rolled vernation. So the leaves in zoysia grass are gonna come out rolled. Bermuda grass is a fold in half. Centipede, carpet, uh, St. Augustine grass, Bermuda grass, all have folded vernation. Zoysia grass is rolled, has hairs at the legule, uh, fairly narrow leaf blades, depending on the, the specific species we're looking at. It does have both rhizomes and stolons. You can see in the picture here, again, now a dense grouping of hairs. A dense grouping of hairs looks very similar to centipede grass, right? So knowing the stolon, the, the, just looking at the legule is not gonna be enough. What's different between the centipede and zoysia? They both have ligules that look the same. Growth habits different. Zoysia is going to have stolons and rhizomes. Leaf tips are different. Zoysia has a pointed leaf tip. Centipede has a blunt one, right? What's the last thing that's different? The vernation. Zoysia is rolled. Centipede's folded. So if you just look at the ligule, you're like, oh, there's a big dense group of hairs there. You could make 
a pretty big mistake in terms of identifying which grass it is, right? Because that's not by itself enough. But as we start to pull these pieces together and we think about, okay, well, I need to understand, I need to know what the growth habit is. How are we going to know whether it has stolons and rhizomes? You pull it up or, or more ideally cut it up. So, you know, take a pocket knife, a, a cup cutter, something, a shovel, and, and dig a piece of it up so that you can rotate, you know, if you, you can do it cleanly, you know, you cut out a, a, a little triangle of it or whatever, uh, a pocket knife is nice, be able to cut just a small section up and, and lift that out and look through that profile of the soil, to see whether there's any rhizomes below the soil surface. Stones are going to be easy to find, but you need to look below the soil surface to see if you find any rhizomes. Without taking that step, you could complicate your ability to identify what the grass is, right? Um, talking about common names, I left this in here on purpose, Japanese long grass. Japanese long grass is specifically referring to the Zoysia japonicas. There's two species of Zoysia that we're gonna talk about, Zoysia japonicas and Zoysia matrellas. Japanese long grass is Zoysia japonica. Uh, it was interesting after class on Monday, when we, well, in class on Monday, we were talking about St. Augustine grass and Ron mentioned or asked if buffalo grass was the uh, same thing that St. Augustine grass was referred to in Australia. And about half hour after class, I got an email from him like, sure enough, in Australia, St. Augustine grass or steam to from second datum is referred to as buffalo grass. Now we have a buffalo grass here, right? That we talked about on Monday, but what is buffalo grass here? Bucloidactyloides, and it's a native grass to the, the plains area, the Midwest of the United States. Very different. It's not, doesn't look at all like St. Augustine grass. But uh, the common names can be confusing when you're trying to talk about people, you know, for, to people from different parts of the country or even different parts of the world. Um, Zoysia grass has a very nice, dense leaf canopy. It tends to be uh, something that that people like it has a finer leaf texture than than St. Augustine grass. It can be maintained at a lower height of cut than St. Augustine grass. And if there's an, a negative to it, it's some of the disease aspects that can be tough in some cases. And the canopy itself is pretty stiff. So if you're walking across it barefooted, it's going to feel less appealing than maybe St. Augustine grass or Bermuda grass. Adapted to a lot of soil conditions, it's tolerant to drought and heat. In fact, zoysia grass, not only is it tolerant to heat, it is pretty damn tolerant to cold temperatures, more than, than St. Augustine grass. Uh, we've got a, fact, well, a potential faculty member here visiting from Iowa State that we're hoping to hire. And you know, he was talking about how you know, they're able to maintain, and I went to Iowa State, we, I, I knew this, but you know, we can maintain zoysia grass in Iowa easily. Talked about the example I had from when I was working in Wisconsin Extension, where there was a homeowner that had their yard planted with zoysia, and for the first two or three months of spring and the last couple months of fall, the yard was brown because it was outside the ideal conditions for the zoysia and it went dormant. During the middle of summer, it looked great. It can handle the cold. It's slow to green up in the spring, uh, starts to discolor when temperatures drop into the 50s. And if you looked at the weather conditions now uh, up in the northern parts of the United States, guarantee the areas that have zoysia grass are starting to go dormant or they will very soon. Very wear tolerant. This is a great thing until the wear gets so much that it wears it out. So it's very wear tolerant and it can work well in yards that have pets and things like that because it can handle the wear. But if they wear through it, it's very slow to recover. So while, that, while the canopy itself is resistant to wear, particularly compared to St. Augustine grass because it's a, a coarser, tighter, denser leaf blade, once you wear it out, it's slow to recover. Where something like Bermuda grass tends to recover pretty quickly because it's, it has a much more rapid growth and aggressive growth. Um, it has heat and drought tolerance if it doesn't have a nematode pressure, great salt tolerance, and like I just mentioned, great winter hardiness or cold tolerance. It is slow to grow. Difficult to mow actually with uh, with 
any type of lawnmower, if you have a zoysia grass lawn, having a sharp mower blade and a high quality mower can be really important because the canopy is so hard to cut that it can bog down mowers really easily. So having a sharp blade is important, not only to get a clean cut because the leaves tend to shred, but you need to have the power to actually cut through that canopy or you end up going through it really slow, otherwise it bogs the mower down. Uh, this is typical of what you'll see in landscapes in the Midwest and, and northern parts of the United States where zoysia grass is planted as you go into the fall. The grass, zoysia grass all goes dormant. You got cool season grass mixed in here. Why do you think there's cool season grass mixed in, particularly in this part of the landscape and maybe even right up here by the house? The amount of shade of the trees. The amount of shade under the trees would be a, a big indicator for me because the cool season grasses are more shade tolerant than any of our warm season grasses. And so the microclimate here, and even up here, depending, I, I didn't take this picture, I don't know for a fact, but I would guess that this is probably the north side of a house where it's getting shade through the afternoon, has created a microclimate in this part of the yard where the cool season grasses can thrive because there's less light than the warm season grass is able to tolerate. Moderate intensity in terms of culture, you really don't wanna maintain it higher than three inches. And actually a lot of our research here recently has shown that maintaining zoysia grass is really better at you know, two, two and a half inches. As you start to get higher in height of cut, you have a lot more thatch problems. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about culture management, culture management of the grasses. But thatch is this accumulation of organic matter above the soil. And that accumulation of organic matter complicates things for disease development, root growth, insect uh, populations. So at higher heights of cut, it can really start to accumulate thatch. Uh, low fertility, uh, moderate to low fertility, less uh, fertilizer typically than St. Augustine grass and really irrigating it as needed. It doesn't need a lot, but I'd argue that none of our worm season grasses need a lot. It's more about timing than it is amount. Um, with the uh, uh, height of cut here, the challenge with zoysia grass in our residential landscapes, mentioned that St. Augustine grass dominates a lot, floor time specifically dominates a lot of our landscape, right? Does anybody know offhand what the recommended height of cut is for St. Augustine? Remember, three to four inches. We often encourage people to be in that three and a half to four inches if possible. So if their landscape management company is coming through and they're mowing everyone's yard that's on their list, right? They've got their mowers set for maintaining home lawns. 70% or more of the home lawns are St. Augustine grass. You can almost assume that, that the majority of those are gonna be floor tam. They're probably set to mow it three and a half or four inches. So when they get to a zoysia grass lawn, they're probably not going to mow, mow it lower. They're not in really, see you later, Carl. Uh, they're not going to make huge adjustments on a lawn by lawn basis unless they're really a good business that knows what they're doing. So if they maintain every zoysia grass lawn, like they do St. Augustine grass, we're going to put that zoysia grass lawn into a, a higher risk of failing because it's going to create more thatch create more issues with insect and disease, more issues with rooting, and, and just complicate management over time. And one of the biggest things we've seen with zoysia grass lawns failing is that they've been maintained more like San Jose grass. Number of cultivars available, you don't need to know them. A couple of pictures here, or at least a picture of a San Jose, or sorry, zoysia grass lawn can be very, very visually you know, appealing in terms of its appearance because it has a fine leaf texture. Um, zoysia matrella. So we've got two species of zoysia grass that we look at managing in turf. The japonicas tend to be, like that Japanese long grass, the japonicas tend to be more of the residential type use. The matrellas are much finer in leaf texture. They uh, have a dense canopy. They lack cold tolerance compared to the japonicas. And we see them used in uh, fact, um, on golf course putting greens. You, some of these can be maintained at putting green height. Uh, they use them in shaded uh, greens in some cases because zoysia grass is a little bit more shade tolerant than Bermuda grass. Uh, they do produce a nice putting surface. The leaves tend to be very stiff and sort of upright. So the putting surface tends to be slower than Bermuda grass, 
but it is a grass that can be maintained at lower heights of cut. And it is a really beautiful lawn or, or can produce a really beautiful lawn if you wanted to use it in a residential landscape because it has these fine, really, really fine leaf texture, uh, probably half the leaf, half the width of a japonica leaf plate, much lower height of cut. And as you go lower in height of cut, your frequency of mowing has to go up. So the trade-off with doing that is that as you go into some of these grasses that have lower heights of cut, your maintenance has to increase dramatically if you want to try to maintain it over time. What are the, what are the spots? Do you know? uh, that is probably, so looking at this, and, I, and again, I, yeah. I, don't, I didn't take this picture, but that to me looks like it's a relatively new installation. And that's probably some scalping where the sod wasn't laid entirely flat. That's what that, that, that right there. So you, and what I'm looking at here, so if you watch the cursor, there's a line right there. Yeah. You can see it. There's a line here, another line here, and another line here. And those spots that you're talking about stop right at that margin. To me, that probably is sod that was not laid exactly flat or cut exactly, you know, it's with a little bit of a high spot. And when they go across and mow it, you're scalping a little bit of it off there compared to the areas surrounding it. That's what it looks like to me. Okay. Over time, that'll smooth out and the, and the grass will, you know, those scalp areas will leaf back out and you won't see it as much over time, but that, that's what it looks like to me. Um, the Petrellas, or sorry, Manila, the Petrellas are the finest textured, densest, and slowest growing of the zoysia grass species. And really, because they don't have a tremendous amount of cold tolerance, they're better in the tropics, you know, more warm climates than what we have even here in Central Florida. There's some cultivars that have been developed that uh, have come on the market. There's a couple of breeders out in, in Texas that have really pushed them because they, they're really well suited for the climate in Texas. Uh, we don't have anything that has done really, really well in Florida. Disease tends to be a big problem with them. The Paspalum uh, genus, We've got two of them that we're going to talk about, Bahia grass and Sutro Paspalum. Paspalum notatum and Paspalum vaginatum. Bahia grass itself, if you haven't put your hands on Bahia grass, if you're here in Pinefield, you can walk out behind the building in that big pasture area past where they're building the, the bluegrass, or sorry, the blueberry building. Most all of that's Bahia grass out there. Almost, almost any roadside has Bahia grass. Or if you happen to just be going through and you see seed heads that are about a foot and a half tall, probably, probably Bahia grass. Vernation isn't gonna help a lot in terms of identification because it has both rolled and folded vernation. It has a, so the textbook says it has a membranous ligule. Basically there's no ligule. You won't see anything at all. There's not, there's not a, a appreciable membranous ligule there to see. The leaf blade uh, is pretty flat. Another sort of thing that's interesting about the textbook says the textbooks say they have rhizomes and stolons. You won't find a green stolon on the hair grass. All right. So arguably, from my standpoint, my opinion, people that taught me, is a rhizominous grass. The rhizomes, they're always brown. They never have chlorophyll in them. Uh, so I, I would argue that this is a rhizominous grass, even though from a botanical standpoint, some of these are a Technically, kind of found at the surface of the soil, but they don't have chlorophyll. If we look at stolons as having chlorophyll and being at the surface of the soil, then really these are closer to being rhizomes that are just kind of not quite buried in the soil. All right. Wide range of soil conditions used in soil maintenance, uh, soil stabilization, uh, roadsides. It uh, is propagated by seed and establishes by seed pretty easily. It has a fairly resistant open turf. Remember when we talked about the centipede, if you look down on it, it doesn't have a really dense canopy, but if it's maintained and mowed regularly, it can actually look pretty decent. The seed heads are the biggest detractor from it. Well adapted to infertile soils. It has a deep, extensive root system. Um, there have been people who have, have gone down and tried to, to find the bottom of the roots in Bahia grass, and they've been able to track roots down six feet or more into the soil. Now, whether or not there's a, there's a lot of 
thought and discussion. The majority of the roots, when we talk about any of our turf grasses, the majority of the roots, 70% or more, are going to be in the top, top six inches or eight inches of the soil. Everything's almost at the top. Grasses like the hair grass have ones that go down a lot deeper. How much those contribute to actual drought resistance or drought tolerance is still a point of like discussion and argument because it's, there's not an extensive amount of them down there. And how much they actually contribute to that plant being able to tolerate and resist drought is a point of discussion, but they do have deep extensive root systems. Can produce by sod. Uh, we see a lot of sod production of Bahia grass in Florida, but that sod almost always, not in every case, but almost always is taken off of pastures. So there'll be a Bahia grass pasture where they run livestock for you know maybe one or two years, and they'll come in and harvest sod off. A lot of that sod goes to roadside establishment and things like that. But if you do get sod that came from a, a pasture, it's not going to be as uniform in terms of thickness. It'll probably have some of the high and low spots in it. And it's probably going to have, you know, whatever the cows or horses or whatever left behind in some cases, which can be a detractor for at least that first little bit when you plant it. Um, very low maintenance, relative, relatively free of insect pests. It can get mole crickets, but mole crickets rarely cause enough damage to kill it. And uh, from a disadvantage standpoint, the seed heads are probably the biggest thing aesthetically. Now, Dr. Kenworthy and Dr. Blunt, Ann Blunt, and several other people have been working on some Bahia grass cultivars that have a, a tighter growth. Uh, they don't grow as high vertically. They have lower seed head production, um, and they look very promising. The challenge that they've run into with that process is that the hair grass as a species is seen by the sod producers as a seeded grass, as a low value grass. So getting them to look at this and say, hey, well, if there's gonna be a market for this grass that will demand a higher price has been a challenge because they don't really know that they're gonna be able to take it, produce it in sod and get a price similar to maybe Pasphalum or, uh, sorry, uh, zoysia grass or Bermuda grass or uh, St. Augustine grass on a square foot basis, because if you can, you may have this high value cultivar, but it's Bahia grass. And if you're trying to sell it for 25 cents a square foot and somebody down the road is selling Bahia grass for six or eight cents a square foot, well, yeah, mine's better. Mine's better germplasm. It has a tighter growth habit, has lower seed head production. Yeah, but you're charging four times as much and it's still Bahia grass. So why would I pay four times as much when I don't really know if this is gonna give me anything better and I just want my hair grass. So there, there, there's a, a disconnect there that has kind of limited the willingness to take this and try to run with it. We'll stop here. Um, it is very low maintenance. The two primary cultivars on the market right now that you'll come across are Pensacola and Argentine. Uh, Pensacola tends to be finer textured and Argentine has better density and the color and responds a little bit better to fertilizer than what Pensacola does. But to be honest with you, if you go and ask the hair grass, who knows which one you're going to get. You're going to get the hair grass, but there's a good chance that they don't know the cold. Questions about anything? All right. We'll stop here. We'll see you guys Friday. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cruz. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, just a second. I, let me get closer to the uh, closer to the speaker so I can hear you. Just a second. Yeah. Um, you showed that picture of establishing zoysia grass, I believe, and that that looks really um, bad. How would you fix that? It looked really what? It it looked like it was really not establishing well. The one with all the weeds? Yeah, I, I want to know like how you fix that. Is it just lots of pre-emergent all so the time? The seed, establishing by seed is a challenge. There's only a couple pre-emerged type products that you can use at the time of seeding that won't impact the, the uh, they're basically short-term products that break down pretty quickly before the seed starts to germinate or, or like sprigging where the sprigs start to get roots. And so, 
there's a couple things that you can use. The challenge with something like centipede grass or some of these that take longer to germinate is that, and to establish a canopy is that you might control the weeds for a little bit that are that first flush of growth after you've tilled it, you've established your base plant, you know, your topography, you seed into it. You might be able to control that first flush of weeds, but that second or third or fourth that come after that become a lot more difficult to control because you're looking at post-emergent application and the, a lot of the post-emergent uh, products tend to be a lot hotter on seedling grasses and can cause issues with you know, damaging the seedlings. And so it, it's a function of, you know, there's a lot of broadleaves in that. You probably would be trying to mow them to try to keep them down uh, as much as you could. And maybe some select broadleaf, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Okay. It's not a really good, good approach to it. I was just wondering if like, yeah. if somebody sent you a picture like that, how, what would you recommend? Would you just tell them to start over? No, not necessarily. It's just a matter of making sure that the turf grass seedlings kind of mature, have a chance to mature a little bit, and then being careful about your post-emergent applications to try to get those weeds under control. But you don't pick something that's going to be a high risk for the seedling grass. So maybe like they should have solarized the soil first and started from even, plugs instead even of springs. That could have been, a, it could still be a challenge. I mean, yeah, there's only so much you could do to try to yeah. kill off a seed bank or something like right. that, but right. and that especially with grass. Picture, that particular picture, I'd argue that, you know, they probably should have been trying to mow some of those broadleaf weeds down sooner than when the picture was taken. Because if you, you know, a lot of the broadleaves, the apical meristem is at the top of the plant. If you cut that off, you'll kill them. And so keeping that canopy of weeds lower so that you get more light down to the grass can help a lot. And then when the grass is mature enough, you can come in with some post-emergent products to try to knock out anything that's left. All right. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's a great answer. I, I don't, that, that'll help me understand. Thank you. All right. Thank All right, you. Have a good one. Bye. You.